everybody, a very warm welcome to another session on dissecting capitalism. We have with us today Professor Katharina Pister. She doesn't need any introduction, especially to our YSI members. She has been associated with YSI and INET for many years now, and we are very excited to have her with us at the South Asia Working Group. Katharina Pister is the Edwin B. Parker Professor of Comparative Law at Columbia Law School and the director of the Law School Center on Global Legal Transformation. Her work spans over comparative law and corporate governance, law and finance, law and development. Her most recent book is The Code of Capital, which has been making headlines across the world. And she will be talking to us on the laws of capital. The main question being, why is capitalism a system that is coded in law so resilient to legal governance and possible solutions? Over to you, Professor. Thank you so much uh, for having me today. It's a real pleasure to be back with YSI. I think I always say this is the best project that INET has ever launched um, is, is the YSI network, seriously. Bringing to, uh, together um, all of you young scholars and, and, uh, and to, to network and to create new ideas and to collaborate and talk to different people is just a, a wonderful setting. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Let me um, share my screen because it might uh, make it a little easier to follow the presentation. I'm just gonna go up here. Here, hang on, just do this, and yeah, here we are. So um, uh, let me just jump to the first um, puzzle that you already mentioned, Anisha. So the, I'm actually working on a second book. I thought I, I, I have to carve out time. So I also want to stop talking just about the Code of Capital, but I will talk about it a little bit because the project builds on the Code of Capital. And um, I was actually asked to write the first uh, volume in a series of books that uh, will be com uh, coming out at Yale University Press that are supposed to lay the... <laughs> conceptual foundations for the LPE move movement, the law political economy movement. And um, they asked me, this is David Geber at Berkeley and Jed Purdy uh, from Columbia, who unfortunately is moving back to Duke, but um, uh, they asked me to write a book on the laws of, or the law of capitalism. I call it the laws, plural of capitalism. And after doing some background reading and thinking about it a lot over the last summer, I came up with this puzzle as the guiding uh, question that I want to try to answer in this book and maybe go beyond as well. But I've learned years and years and years ago in my own studies that having a, a good puzzle is uh, one of the most important uh, strategies, not the only one, but a good strategy to conceive of a research project and to find also a tractable project that you can master in a book length or even article length um, a project. So here, this is the puzzle. Why is capitalism, a system that is coded in law, as I argue in the code of capital, so resilient to legal governance, right? Because I think what I will try to explain is that capitalism escapes our conventional uh, mechanisms of legal governance time, of, time and again, so I'm jumping already, and, and, and I want to explain why th that is. And that brings me to the laws of capitalism or the laws of capitalist law. What is the logic behind the legal systems that makes it so easy, relatively easy? It takes time, sometimes we're better at constraining capitalism and pushing it into a different directions, but um, very often we fail at doing that and why that is, that's the question I proposed um, to myself. I just should say at the um, upfront, I have um, drafted uh, two, the first two chapters are already sort of revised. I have th three more chapters in draft form. Everything is still work in progress. So presenting this work here is also for me an opportunity to learn from you. And I would really um, welcome critical feedback. Um, is this a good puzzle? Are the laws of capitalism persuasive? Am I missing something? That kind of thing would be really helpful for me. So I will just uh, talk a little bit about the coding of capital, just that we put this down again uh, from, from, from the previous book. Then I will identify what I call the laws of capitalism, talk a little bit also conceptually and theoretically about whether there is such a thing as capitalist law, and if so, what other people have said about what makes law capitalist. And then I wanted to also, this is a, one of the challenges that I pose myself in the book is, how would the legal system have to change to actually meet the demands of climate change, which is, of course, the situation that we find ourselves in. And it's another way in which you can ask, how does capitalist law really work? For whose interest does it work? And what would we have to do to reconfigure the system uh, 
to make sure that we can leave, live within the bounds of a, uh, of a bounded system like the planet Earth, which can't expand. Capitalism always pretends, of course, that we can expand in, in, in indefinitely. And of course, we can't expand the natural system indefinitely. And so what would have to give, this is, I think, another way to think through what exactly the capitalist legal system looks like and what a system would look like where we changed fundamental principles of the system and it probably we wouldn't no longer call it capitalist. That's basically my working hypothesis. If we really lived up to the principles of climate change and li living within our means, at least along some of the dimensions that are relevant for us today, then probably we will no longer call it capitalist. I don't want to go down just into definition, but conceptually, I think that's, that's the point that I'm trying to make in this book. So um, first of all, going back to the previous book, I argue, of course, in the book that capital is coded in law. Capital being defined as a wealth generating or wealth protecting asset. So it's not just any object, any promise or any, um, any idea, but those that we have put, as I sometimes say, on legal steroids that have certain protections. And so you could think of capital as a particular asset that enjoys legal protections and they're backed by the institutionalized means of coercion. So I think of the legal system, actually the ways in which societies have decided to make uh, the consolidated centralized means of coercion available to different agents within society, right? Uh, so just maybe moving away from this abstract notion of here's the state and there's the market, um, here's the state, here's the economy, but saying, okay, what, what this is really all about um, uh, is that we have consolidated the means of coercion in something that we call the state, but it's a much more open and fluid thing if we really think it through. And the question is, if the centralized means of coercion is so, central for the idea of the state who can actually mobilize these centralized needs of coercion for what type of purposes that brings you of course beyond just the material substantive private laws into procedural uh, law that plays a much larger role in, in in this new book project than in my previous book project so just again i think the simple formula that i develop in the code of capital is give me any object idea or promise i call them together an asset and with the right legal coding, I can flip any object idea or promise into a, 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 a capital asset. You could of course have other resources as well. I think data would be something that doesn't, is not really captured by ideas or, or promises either, but, but is of course an important uh, way in which another important asset that has been coded as capital is being coded as capital. Um, the core attributes of capital um, that I identify in the book is priority, durability, convertibility, and universality. So what the law does, it basically ranks different types of claims to the same asset and give some holders priority rights, property rights, but also collateral law being important examples. It creates durability of these rights that have been created by stratifying access to these assets, basically by shielding assets from some groups of claimants while still giving access to them, to other groups of claimants. And the most important examples are corporate law, the veil of the corporate um, the, 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 the corporate veil that basically surrounds these assets that are accessible to the company itself, to the creditors of the company, but not necessarily to the shareholders or the personal creditors of the shareholders. Convertibility is the way in which uh, financial assets attain something like durability. So it's not so much that you want to keep them together, but that you want to be able to flip them into a safer asset on demand in, in times of uh, financial crisis. So it's kind of a liquidity guarantee that you might get either through pr private contracting from another private entity, but preferably you want to have access to, to state issued um, currency at the end of the game, because that's the only financial asset that can retain its nominal value, not necessarily its real value, but it does retain its nominal value, which is worth a lot in times of crisis. And last but not least, of course, um, universality means that the legal system backs these arrangements. The arrangements are done mostly in private law um, through private arrangements, of course, using institutions that are backed by the coercive powers of the state. So if you, if you play by the minimum rules um, and requirements that are set up for each of, of these institutions, you can harness the, um, uh, the, the coercive powers of the state, provided, of course, that you meet certain procedural requirements as well that has to be disentangled a little bit more, because I think many claims that people might want to bring where they make a claim that they have maybe better rights than somebody else, might not go through because they can't bring that claim, right? Because they don't have standing in a court of law. 
The legal modules that I discuss in the book, as you might recall if you read it, is property law, collateral law, trust, corporate law, bankruptcy, contract law, the broader area of, 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 pri of private law. But that's basically, I focus on that. I don't talk, talk much about administrative law, regulatory law in the book at all, because I wanted to show that um, uh, you know, pr private individuals and entities can harness a legal system, which is basically the institutionalization of the means of coercion, who has what kind of rights and can use the powers of the state to back these rights. You have basically a toolkit uh, made available that you can use to protect your own interests without necessarily getting having to get any kind of ex ante approval. And you need sanctioning exposed only if and when challenged. Otherwise, you basically have a, a, a relatively free right. Okay, let me get the pointer here to the right point. Okay. So the assets that are coded as capital that I discuss in the book are land firms, promises, ideas, and know-how. I also talk a little bit about the genetic code, uh, coding na nature's code is one of the chapters, and I mentioned already data is another type of asset that you could add. So what capitalism has done, essentially, um, or what, what people have done that have coded capital, I should say, is finding new types of objects, promises, resources, ideas, and finding ways to, to enclose them to create ranking uh, mechanisms to make sure that some have better rights over them than others. And there's actually no limit. We do this with genetic code. We of course do this also with nature in a major way now during um, uh, the, the, the climate change uh, challenge because we're, we're, we're using uh, green assets to offset brown assets and, and we're labeling, labeling all kinds of uh, assets as green assets. So you can see the same mechanism as at work um, when you look at the specific response that uh, that capitalism or people who operate in the capitalist mode are using to address the climate change. And I think the results of these of these uh, approaches are quite predictable. I'll come back to this a little later. Okay, so um, now I come basically to what I posed as a puzzle, puzzle up front. Um, when you look back in history and you look at the processes of coding capital, um, these processes were very often interrupted by crises. And the crisis might be the proverbial exogenous shock, like a natural disaster, a collapse of international commodity markets, a, a drought, a storm, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so then people have to reconfigure somehow, find ways to get out of their contracts. Sometimes the state intervenes and, and uh, issues a debt moratorium or something, or helps uh, people. But for a very long period of time, there was uh, mostly sort of private law and then sort of ad hoc interventions by the state. And I think this began to change in a major way in the 19th century. We get more more and more what we now call regulation or the administrative state, the rise of the regulatory states as authors in the field have said that. Um, and this basically means that we harness our centralized means of coercion in a different way, right? So we basically mobilize certain institutions of the state, uh, a regulator that has certain types of powers to rein in the excesses of the capitalist system. Uh, most importantly, at the beginning, I would say banking regulation, you know, after a series of bank runs and bank crashes, it was clear that this was deeply politically destabilizing. And so you get more and more banking regulation in the 19th century, already extended to capital market regulation either in corporate law or in, in securities and exchange regulation than in the United States, you get antitrust intervention. So when you look at sort of the responses to the system, time and again, we go in and we decide collectively as a legislature as re um, to set up other institutional mechanisms to make sure that we can monitor, control, supervise, and maybe intervene at some point in time. Whoops, I'm sorry, my mouse is a little flippy here this morning. Okay, so what I'm basically arguing, um, all of these interventions were important, have changed the system in, 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 in certain ways, but typically the effectiveness of these um, interventions has diminished over time. Right. So you just can't have a, a simple fix. And maybe you can argue that in a dynamic economic or social systems, you never ever have a, a fix that will stick. But I think what I find um, interesting, and that's part of the, the puzzle, is sort of the speed and also ferociousness with which we can see legislatures, um, legislature regulation or their implementation being rolled back um, by different types of mechanisms. And that's basically what I try to um, uh, explain. So we see that you sometimes have lobbying with legislators, we just uh, move back on that. We have new interpretations by the courts. Uh, we have, of course, ways to get around it. So one of the typical responses in the private sector is to find ways to mute 
the effectiveness of regulatory interventions that have been put in place, um, the strengthening of the ideology and the arguments um, that individual rights trump everything else. And so you need to give more rights to individuals and the individuals need that freedom to do this and thereby um, might have a justification to not only arbitrage around, but might maybe sometimes um, collide with these rules and regulations head on. And of course, uh, we have uh, various mechanisms to deflect liability, sometimes enacted um, on top of what we have in private law anyhow, by having ceilings for liability of liability for nuclear energy and for, of course, back in the 19th century for railroads already, right? We encourage private investment in certain risk businesses by basically capping the liability, violating every rule, of course, of economics in terms of the internalization of, um, of costs of using certain assets, but we just have socialized a lot of these costs and thereby made it easier again for capitalists to code capital. So just a few examples. I think you can go on and on and find these examples. I don't, and you can of course find also counter examples, but I think, you know, it's, it's an interpretative history that I'm telling again, as I did in my previous book. I'm basically saying we've seen the rise of the regulatory state already in the late 19th, early 20th century. It's expanding, of course, uh, especially after World War II, it's very often described as the golden age by Piketty and, 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 and others, but we also see already starting at least in the 1960s, if not in the 1950s already in the United States, a backlash against that ideologically first, increasingly institutionally, uh, people getting out of this, trying to find ways to, to engage in activities um, that are uh, in principle not, not allowed, but you find other ways to get around them. And then officially, of course, with Reagan and, and Margaret Thatcher, we have a policy reversal so that many of the regulations and rules that had been put in place earlier, think of the Glass-Steagall Act, think of antitrust law in this country, are no longer enforced, right? That's sort of the first step. That's an ideological policy move, pol political move and then we entrench it in the 1990s by repealing certain laws rolling back uh, and, and 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 all the while of course keeping the full backing of state power for the privately coded capital in place and making it even, even easier to code capital privately by opening borders by giving people the uh, the uh, opportunity to, to pick and choose their laws from different jurisdictions um and we see this even after we, you know, we were presented a bill for what we did, I think, in the 1990s and 1980s, for what actually we've done since the 1970s, uh, securitization, shadow banking, is all, you know, these are all practices that um, have emerged at the niches between or the intersection between regulatory activities in the financial sector and what, with the help of private law institutions, the very institutions, the modules of the code of capital that I mentioned, you can get around them and create an entire financial system, the so-called shadow banking system, that is a parallel banking system to the formerly regulated banking system. That system crashed in 2008. Um, it, it began to fall apart in 2007. It could have brought down the entire financial system in 2008 and of course was rescued with the help of central banks. Um, and uh, at the time, I have to say, I thought it was important to rescue the system. I did not want to see the system completely crash for fear of what the consequences might be. And I think we have to be honest about this is that if a very complex system crashes in a major way, we cannot possibly predict what the outcome would be. And uh, maybe also being German and thinking about what happened to Germany last time this happened, uh, we got fascism, right? Um, and so, 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 so that kind of uncertainty, I think, leads um, policymakers to try to stabilize the system. But it also basically means that we forego any opportunity to reform um, the system in any fundamental way. So we fix it at the edges, which is also why perhaps in comparison to what happened in the 1930s or in the immediate uh, post-war period um, did not happen again in 2008. We basically did a, a patch up of um, the rules and regulations, the governance regimes that we had. So banks were put on a much um, stronger regulatory footing again. Um, and, and banks, because the idea was if they fail, that's the biggest problem. But of course, uh, we still have um, a, a shadow banking that came roaring back shortly thereafter and uh, size wise uh, competes well with a formerly regulated banking system. We have better resolution regimes for financial intermediaries, but also um, uh, uh, maybe not as forceful as we needed. And, and again, again and we haven't really touched in a major way the all the practices that together amount to these shadow banking practices. I would say on top of that, we've seen many of these practices that we 
could identify at least with hindsight at Lehman Brothers or, or even the financial intermediaries that survived, we've seen the same practices migrate to non-financial corporations. Um, so when you look at sort of the, the big bankruptcy of a number of non-corporate firms in the United States, many of them who had experienced financial distress um, had then seen equity funds come on board as their owners and, and instill the kind of practices that we've seen at Lehman Brothers before, basically creating internal capital markets within the corporate uh, form using multiple corporate forms to, to, to do so um, and, and using that mostly to um, strip or extract value from the firms for the benefit of the shareholders and the company itself ended up in, in bankruptcy quite frequently. Um, so, so we have basically seen 2008 an attempt to do some regulation. A lot of the regulatory reforms also don't really work. Uh, I think the coordination of regulators in, in FSOC in the United States is, 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 is not really working. There are just ideological differences between the different regulators that haven't been overcome. And I don't see many attempts to do so right now. Anyhow, at the same time, of course, we have seen the market response trying to use the toolkit that has worked so well for so many in the run up decades to the financial crisis to just apply this to different um, assets, uh, to, to, to um, non-financial non corporations, as I meant before, but also for the financial sector to try to mute the effects of the reforms to make sure that um, practices are not burdened by too, much, too many costs of regulation. Um, so, you know, so the whole idea that you have skin in the game, all these rules that were put, put in place, the private sector um, figured out relatively quickly um, how to mute, mute them. Again, you know, when you talk to practitioners in, in, in law office in New York, um, they would basically say it's, it's always a matter of time, but we do figure out how to mute the impact of regulation with, for our clients, um, if, at least eventually. Right? So given that, let me just see what I did here. No, exactly, given all that, um, uh, so this is the background for my, for my um, puzzle saying sort of, we've seen so many episodes in trying to get the system under control. We also see it always grow out of it again. And somehow we're never able to catch it before it ends up in a crisis. And even once we have a major crisis, like in 2008, our responses are muted. They're trying to stabilize the system that we have um, rather than uh, make uh, major reforms. And in part, maybe also just out of fear, what would happen if we try to reform a system, the complexity of which uh, maybe uh, just exceeds what we can imagine is actually still governable at some level. I've, I've hosted a workshop or helped co-sponsor a workshop at uh, the Berlin Academy of Science um, a couple of years ago and the collective wisdom of the people in the room at the end of the day said, this is an ungovernable system that we have created. It is created in by humans and for humans, but it's in the end ungovernable. And I think that probably drives also the actions of some of the central banks or other agents that are still involved in governing that they that they um, realize that it's it's um, it, the complexity makes it always dangerous to intervene at some level because you know you don't know what might bring the system uh, down. This is also something I think we should keep in mind as we now see maybe the increase of interest rates and the attempt to maybe also offload the balance uh, sheets of the central banks, it's really not quite clear what the response to this would be in the financial sector. So now I'm just stepping back in this slide a little bit and I've asked myself, um, you know, how have other people thought about um, what makes law capitalist? And what is quite startling when you think about this in this way is that in the standard comparative law literature in the West, you rarely, if ever, read something about capitalist law. They talk about law, um, they talk about the legal families, the common law and the civil law, and uh, whether it's the French version or the German version, but they rarely talk explicitly about the fact that this is, these systems have all uh, grown up and um, are imb imbricated with and support a system that we would call capitalist. Um, uh, what the standard competitive law literature has done at some point is that it has recognized that there might be something like socialist law. Big debate about this because law, socialist law might not be really law because it's all dictated by the state, da, 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 da. But most comparative law uh, books at some point said there is a, such a thing as um, socialist law, but of course scrapped that from the book the minute the socialist um, uh, world uh, embarked on a transition, um, or we would sh should say rather transformation to also an unknown future and, and the results of that, of course, we experience in, in, um, uh, in, in 
the uh, geopolitical disaster that is uh, playing itself out in Ukraine um, today. Um, uh, so, so we, so, um, but the point I want to make is sort of the idea of thinking about legal systems as a capitalist or socialist was something that was anathema to most standard comparative law analysis. Until I think um, Andre Schleifer, who's of course the mastermind of the law and finance literature and, and his co-authors, including uh, Simeon Jankov, um, developed sort of this idea of the new comparative economics. And that was based on the law and finance literature. And they basically said at the outset of this paper, it used to be that we were pitching in economics, in the economics debate, capitalism versus communism or capitalism versus socialism since the big debates in the 1930s. But after the demise of the socialist system, the real debate is now between common law and civil law because the law and finance literature had basically said, um, legal systems are important in organizing these, um, uh, these economic systems and the common law has it's just, just a head start over the civil laws um, in, in terms of uh, financial market um, development. So they have never been able to show this for growth. So more com comprehensive economic indicators don't line up as well with common law versus civil law. But when you just look at financial market development in particular, um, the development of, of stock markets and, and liquid or like liquid security, securities markets, the common law has a heads up over the, the civil law. And so ultimately it's about the investor rights versus state dirigism is, is how, they, how, they, how they would put this. So they don't say explicitly uh, capitalist law, but I think what they're saying is the common law is the top example of a capitalist legal system. And it is that because it prioritizes individual rights. It has stronger property rights. They would say, I kind of, you know, um, after write, uh, writing the code of capital, I would say they, they have a point. I would just reinterpret what they're saying. I think the common law gives um, um, asset holders and their lawyers a heads up in coding new types of assets and harness, harnessing the law basically to create capital. It's not that they just protect, you know, have stronger property rights protection as a static thing, but they allow private agents to create their own property rights. That's what the common law does better, more powerfully than the civil law system, which is much more rigid in policing the boundary between what is property right, what is the contract, contractual right. So in the end, I say in, in the code of capital, capitalist law is a law that has is built around a legal system that is built around malleable rights in private law that enjoy the full backing by state power. It's the cloth from which capital is cut. So it's foundational. These, the, these legal institutions are foundational to capitalist law. There was, however, a really big debate in the 1920s on before, in the first part of the 20th century about whether there is such a thing as capitalist law. And this, this debate was launched very much by the socialist theorist. Um, so of course, Marx himself had argued that law is a superstructure that, that reflects the class antagonism um, and, and, and reflects also the allocation of different rights between labor and capital. Um, as I mentioned in the book, I think I, I would just flip it around. I think without law, you can't even talk about the um, allocation of, or the, the, the resource allocation of the control over the means of production. Um, but I think more, more interestingly, because Marx really, neither Marx nor Engels ever developed a full legal theory. Um, uh, Marx did study law and um, many of his writings are somehow inflected by, by legal thinking as well. And, Quite sophisticated in a quite sophisticated way it's at times, but he um, uh, I think he, he he never went all the way in trying to think about um, the legal system as foundational. Uh, although you can extract some of his you know writings to to, to at least hint in this direction. Pashukhanis, however, is, uh, Yevgeny Pashukhanis, who was who was the leading theorist of the um, of the Soviet Union in the 1920s, he wrote um, a, a book uh, about uh, it was a theory of capitalist law was in um, or socialist law, it was actually much more a, a critique of capitalist law. And, and here's what he says. He basically says all law, all modern law is capitalist, inherently capitalist, right? And this is building, of course, on Marx and Engels notion that in a truly communist system, both the state and the law would wither away, right? So they Given that, they didn't want to attack that or think about whether this is even possible, but given that the new anticipated future order cannot have a state and cannot have a legal system. It's not quite clear how they should really order themselves, but, but that's, I think, the premise on which this is built. Um, so 
that also means that all law that we have today is inherently capitalist. And then he identifies some features of capitalist law. One is the public-private antithesis. And this is really interesting because he, he uh, you know, I think would disagree with the realists and many others who said, well, all law is public. He, he says, actually, in his book, you could also argue then that all law is private, that that makes no, no sense. But what he says is in capitalist law, the antithesis between public and private is essential because it's, it's precisely sort of this, this, this clash between him and that private interest, what are the public interests and the priority for private interest that makes the law capitalist. So it's the priority of individual rights over public needs. And he says this is all comes from private law essentially and sits much more um, uneasily in the public law space. So it's in the public law space that we see these tensions because we still have these private rights, uh, but that, that, that challenge what the public needs might really be um, uh, whereas in the private sector, we have clearly individual versus individual rights, and then we just do, do um, our, our ranking. So he says this division, and we have so many debates. To, I, was, I just got another invitation to a conference to, do, to debate you know, the divide between public and private and whether it's not all dissolved. He basically says, at least at an ideological level, right? You can, this is essential for capitalist law to have these the, the, this tension between public and private. And I have to say, I, I tend to agree with him, um, even though we could, of course, I'm also arguing essentially that all private law is public in the sense that it enjoys the backing of the coercive means. Um, the, the, for purposes of pitching the interest of private parties and private needs and, the sec and, and, and private markets as an ideal, ideational move, it's absolutely essential to have the antagonism team between public and private. So it's much more likely, I think, that the conservatives or the pro-capitalists would insist on this division. And I think it's sometimes counterproductive when the progressives on the left wing says, hey, actually, it's all the same, um, because we don't really get to the core of the debate in this fashion. Um, so so Pashukanis is very explicit in saying law is not neutral and cannot just be filled with different content, whether it's capitalist or socialist. And he takes issue with Karl Renner. Karl Renner was an Austrian theorist. He also became a chancellor and president of, of Austria twice, each time of, after a major world war. He wrote in book before for Pashukhanis, and Pashukhanis refers to him a lot, um, where he basically says, he, he's a positivist, right? He's a positivist, and he, he argues that um, uh, law reflects the material condition of society and provides its substance, um, but if the material conditions change, then the legal system will also change, the law will also change. Um, and uh, yes, and so, so the, the question, of course, is whether the material conditions can change without the legal change. So this is like the, the chicken and egg problem. But he's he, he, he believes that, you know, law is much more important, probably will be with us for much longer than just simply dissolving in a communist uh, world. But um, uh, that uh, if we ch change the uh, economic conditions, the material conditions in society, then the legal system will reflect that, um, will necessarily reflect that as well. Okay, so now I'm coming to how I organize my thoughts for this new project um, and I'm basically going back to my puzzle um, and trying to resolve this puzzle in part leaning on the theorists including Pashokanis and uh, to a lesser extent maybe um, Rena and, and, and others to answer this puzzle. So I'm, I'm basically saying if you want to understand why capitalism, a system that is coded in law, basically uses a social resource, the legal system, to um, uh, build wealth for private individuals and entities primarily, um, why is it so resilient to legal governance, the kind of regulatory public <laughs> governance that comes exposed? And here are the three laws of capitalism, of, of capitalist law. Individual legal entitlements, I call it entitlements rather than subjective rights that I, for reasons I will explain in a second. The decentralized, highly decentralized access to centralized means of coercion and legal arbitrage. So these, these three logics that are embedded in our legal systems make it relatively easily possible, uh, sort of make it, make it possible for um, uh, coders of capital and the asset holders behind them to escape the regulatory means that we have put in place. So first going back to individual legal entitlements, as I call them, um, 
the term that Max Weber uses and the term that Christoph Menke uses in his critique of rights is subjective rights. And then very often in English translations, we also see individual rights. And that conflates, of course, our um, civil and political rights, individual rights with something that I think for which Weber had a much more comprehensive notion. He believed that subjective um, rights, um, or he explained them that based off his, on historical experience, experience and, and materials, that sub subjective rights Rights were basically these kind of individual rights that were grown out of private law primarily um, to, to own property, to be able to organize your own um, uh, private affairs. Um, but I want to just go a step further and say it's not only these kind of um, private law subjective rights that individuals are endowed with the power to own, to contract, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but I would say that in the over the course of uh, the evolution of capitalism, we have stripped a lot of responsibilities of these subjective rights, which is why I want to call them entitlements rather than subjective rights. I want to bring this out in the in the word already. There are legal entitlements because, in many ways, we have insulated the rights holders from the consequences of holding these assets or using them. We have disembedded these rights from responsibilities to neighbors' communities. Uh, there is relatively little reciprocity, um, and yet they can still harness the enforcement powers of, of, of the state. Um, so, of course, we have limited liability in the corporate context. That's a, that, that's a way to, to, to limit responsibility. I think the prime example really where this goes completely overboard is when you think about um, the, the investment treaty context, where you have corporations that are not subjects of international law, therefore also not, uh, not obligated by international law, being endowed with legal rights under international law that insulate them from the domestic law of the countries in which they do business. That's basically the pinnacle of where you can push this. You have rights without responsibilities. Um, and, and, and on top of that, of course, the states on the other end cannot sue the, um, the, the, the multinational corporations under the same principles, right? So it's a, it's a very different um, uh, setting. Okay, so, so that's, that's one. We have basically pushed this notion of subjective rights and individuality to a point where we stripped increasingly the responsibility that should come with this. If we want to stick to individual rights and have this liberal foundation, then, then, the, then the, the rights uh, should be attached directly to uh, an awareness of the rights of others, of course, and responsibilities to others as well as Hanoch Dagan and others have, have, have argued in their, own, in their own books. But that's not what we see in commercial practice. We can see this in part of property law, I, I grant this, but I don't, don't think we see this on the large scale law that is relevant for capitalist assets. Okay, the second law is that we have created a system with highly decentralized access to the centralized means of coercion. That's basically we have configured a legal system that it makes it relatively easy for individuals or individual entities to harness these powers for their own interest. And there's in principle nothing wrong with that, but I think we have to take a closer look at how we exactly have configured this. Why individual rights typically get better standing than any kind of collective rights. Right, so this goes back to the enclosure movement in England in the in the 16th century, when many commoners couldn't ever make it, you know, have a day in court because they were trying to mount a collective rights, the rights of the commoners, and the chancery courts uh, were refusing to give them standing for that. Right, so 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 that that's where many issues are already decided is that you can't even bring this. You either don't have something that is recognized as a right by the law, or we have procedural rules that say you don't have um, a standing. We also have to think about the kind of damages um, that, that, um, that you might get or the cost of litigation. So there's a whole apparatus of, I think, procedural rule, how this affects the material rights um, that, that we might have, that you have, that we, we, we have to take another look at, um, I believe, and, and think about how to reconfigure um, access to the means of coercion. On top of that, of course, you have private arbitration, you have the New York Convention, you can do private arbitration still enforced with the court of law. Nobody looks over the kind of ruling. So we have insulated this process of, of harnessing the means of coercion, uh, we can basically lease, lease the power of the state for something that is decided by agents that have nothing, nothing to do with the state in which the uh, ruling will ultimately be enforced. And last but not least, um, we have what I call legal arbitrage, the concept of regulatory arbitrage is, is, is well known. I want to broaden it a little bit because I want to include both regulatory competition, that is the ability to pick and choose between different jurisdictions, um, that you can you know, cho choose the law um, that best suits your means, which has been expanding uh, um, quite a bit over the last couple of decades. But I also want to um, put into this chapter this whole notion that law inherently 
is incomplete and that you probably won't ever be able to uh, uh, fill all the gaps to make sure that arbitrage is impossible. Um, so there will always be legal arbitrage, but the question of course is how much do we add to this by, by, by facilitating the picking and choosing, the choosing of the law. So I would also say that these three laws of uh, capitalism, of, of the laws of the law of capitalism, um, are um, interrelated, interdependent, and reinforce each other. So if we had only legal entitlements, right, um, and, and not also decentralized access to the means of coercion, I think the, the, the power of these legal entitlements would still be capped, but the combination of having decentralized access to the coercion to create, to enforce the kind of legal entitlements that we have created without obligations um, and, and liabilities attached to them, I think is exactly what uh, has brought us into this overdrive of, of, um, of uh, uh, privileging individual interest and again sort of in the investor space and in the investment law space. I think you see this very glaringly. Um, and last but not least, of course, legal arbitrage, even if we have um, some regulatory responses or other legal responses, legal arbitrage is the means by which we can get around this again. So that's that's basically the cycle. I think so this is the logic of capitalist law that allows it to escape the attempts to regulate it. So I'm not flipping here around again. Let me just go for So the question is, um, are there any prospects for change to the alert as, um, as uh, Lenin asked the question, what is to be done? So the least amenable to change, I basically say it's legal arbitrage because legal arbitrage is in part inherent to any legal system that is used to govern a complex dynamic society economic system, right? There will always be gaps between what is written or what is said in a court of law and, and, and the new facts that come about and that's nothing uh, you know, bad essentially. I think that's just the way it is in a dynamic system. I would also say that if you want to have a relatively dynamic system, um, you also having some kind of uh, relatively decentralized access to the means of coercion is also necessary. So, you know, in, essentially, I, I think legal arbitrage is there, is there to stay, but we can make choices, especially when it comes to the portability of law across jurisdictions, the question whether courts should enforce it or, you know, whether you can harness the capacity of a state to, to use coercion to enforce um, by just picking and choosing the enforcement space because that's why you find the asset, but you've got the ruling somewhere else and nobody overlooks what exactly happens there. So basically Article 5 of the New York Convention on, 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 on the international recognition and enforcement of international and foreign arbitral awards, I would say the public policy exemption should be um, you know, uh, used more aggressively and, and defined much more broadly than as narrowly as it has been over the last couple of dec decades. Um, and I think especially sort of the review at the enforcement stage of the kind of um, arbitrage um, uh, strategies that have, have been developed would be helpful, would also have important ex ante effects because people would um, have faced greater legal uncertainty whether they can enforce that what they have created. Okay, so the subjective rights entitlements is sort of a middle space in terms of can we do something about it? And I'm basically I'm, I'm taking a more reformist um, uh, point of view again. I think you know we, we can't really completely change the system radically, alter it, and and have a new system in place to deal with the cha challenges, let's say, of cha climate change or any. Any, anything else, um, many aspects of the system will also come back because as people, how people have done this is deeply, deeply entrenched. So I think we have to be very strategic and thinking what, where, where can we actually make changes that might over time alter the system in a much more fundamental way, but I don't think this can be done in a big sweep. So that's also something to, you know, subject to, to debate, of course. But um, so I think some, some notion of individual rights and subjective rights are, I think, central to um, any social orders that, that, that have um, values that we can, can call liberal values in the classic sense, but that the rights of individuals mat really, really, really matters. Um, the questions, of course, always how we draw the boundaries um, uh, with regards to the rights of others and what kind of rights trump over those of others. So what avenues of change do we have here? I think the notion that all rights are contingent must be much uh, more strongly enforced. And I think we see a little bit of inkling um, of that. Um, I think so in the climate um, litigation space, courts are recognizing the, that the cost that are imposed on others are a real cost and that formal um, uh, 
uh, le legal entities like corporations can't simply be behind against uh, behind a certain structure that they have created to diffuse liability. So I think allocating liability for harm that has been caused and um, and 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 more um, awareness of responsibility actually lift and enforce responsibility would be critical. Um, and and the mechanism for that would be both the recoding coding of rights, a much stronger um, signaling both in legislation and case law of the reciprocity of rights and responsibilities. Um, um, and backed by um, access to uh, the means of coercion, either by regulators or litigation, basically mobilizing others who can police and enforce these kind of rights. Um, uh, and then I think this is really probably where most of the action will have to be, is who can have at least um, the threat of using the coercive power for certain kinds of uh, um, uh, activities, I think, uh, and, and I don't want to say only litigation, I think we can so solve our social problems through litigation, it takes too long, it's too costly, it's, um, but it's, it's important signaling effect. And when I say access to the means of coercion, that can also be, of course, organized through the classic regulators, or maybe through other means that we create um, um, more space for NGOs, other um, organizations that might be able to claim that they have a, a space to set certain principles and rules and govern the space themselves, or that they might also then challenge the space of others, and then you find some mechanisms to resolve that. So I don't want to sort of hold on just to the institutional structures that we have created, but I want to maybe hold it out or reform it in a way that we, you know, think through standing rules, think through collective actions, think through cost allocation and burden of proof and petition. So many mechanisms that we know, you know, we rarely ever have something fundamentally new under the sun, but taking a closer look at how these mechanisms have changed in favor of um, individually, individual rights that are att att attached to property and, and, and capital um, to think about this in a much more creative way to harness this for, for, for broader um, collective interest as well. Um, and I think scaling back then, of course, private arbitration with the help of public and enforcement um, and, and bringing this back into a public space. We see huge discrepancies in terms of the resource allocation in court systems today. Most court systems are stripped of public resources. They're underfunded. Um, their judges are un underpaid relatively. And a recent study of one of my colleagues here at Columbia has shown, for example, that in all the small claims disputes, most of the parties are not represented by a lawyer at all in an adversarial pr process like the American legal system, right? So courts are struggling because they get briefs that make no sense in the law. Um, and so they're completely under resourced. They, this is just not a, a legal system anymore. People just are struggling with how to make ends meet, how to make claims at all. Whereas on the other end of the spectrum, you have high powered lawyers that advise clients and very often can do private settlements through phone calls with their counterparties or use arbitration and then just go for to, to a court for the execution. Um, that's true in the United States, also true in Germany. I was in a conference recently where one of the judges at the Court of Appeal in Frankfurt says, I, I, I see your masters of the code precisely that, you know, only at the level where we, we enforce arbitration awards. I don't see them otherwise in court. So we have a completely um, fragmented system of evolution, the evolution of new legal principles, which also happens in the court system of having access to the means of coercion, which um, is, you know, privileged for some and incredible hard to get um, for others. And I think that that has to be part of any meaningful um, reform. Okay, so then uh, let me just end by saying this is just, you know, like a snapshot as, um, at where I want to go. I basically thought through and, and give me feedback on this, please. If we were serious about climate change and we wouldn't only want to, you know, do some greenwashing by labels and um, and offsets and things like that. Um, what, what would we, what are the principles of a legal system that we, we would have to think through? And, um, and here, of course, it's uh, some stuff that I said before comes back here. One is you just can't have rights without responsibilities. That's just it. You know, in a bounded system, we have to respect the rights of others. We have to respect also nature, frankly. Um, and, uh, and, and so, 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 so thinking about rights is always inherently bounded and structuring in such a way. So you don't have sort of this, priority rights, sort of this trump card, I have a right, I can enforce it, and that's it, and I don't care what everybody else has to say about that, that has to change. Um, we have to make sure that liability for attributable harm will be attributed to those who have caused it. Um, and that basically means um, uh, rolling back limited liability, uh, legislated li liability caps, all kinds of things. You have to allocate these costs to those who have caused them as a principal matter in legal systems and, 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 and uh, uh, forego the exceptions, no matter how many economic benefits one is promised. 
Um, but then we also have to think about the, um, uh, the, what we do with harm that cannot be easily attributed and how we mutualize the cost or the losses, right? So how you do cost sharing really in a system where it's no longer possible, either because an entity has gone, gone under, we can't really attribute this harm, but how do we create mutualization mechanisms for loss? And that's what capitalism doesn't do at all, right? That's just, that's just um, you know, only maybe in bankruptcy, but in bankruptcy it's also stratified. If you have collateral law, you get out and then you get a haircut for everybody else. But can we have other mechanisms that allocate losses or also in a way that creates um, incentives for living up with the other principles such as no rights without responsibilities? As I said before, I think thinking about access to the means of coercion and thinking about this creatively, you know, we have, we have basically many parts of access to coercion. Every state has its own mechanisms and sophisticated parties know how to harness this power in, for, from different states for their own ends. But thinking about, you know, how would we want to create access to the means of coercion in light of the challenges that we face, who should have access for what kind of purposes should have priority access to this and be able to harness this also in a more dynamic and decentralized way rather than others. And then I think last but not least, and many people in the climate space are talking about this already that um, we have to rethink many of the uh, mechanisms that we use in tort law and, and elsewhere about causation um, uh, and, uh, and predictability, et cetera. We have to really think about how to adapt the law to what people call the precautionary principle. It's complex. We don't know when the harm will, will, will come. We don't know exactly where the harm will, be, will occur. We don't know exactly what kind of mechanisms together will cause that harm, but we know that if we don't do anything, we probably will all be hurt, right? So, um, so abstracting from this notion or finding new ways to think about how we um, should uh, allocate responsibilities, um, uh, it, given that we can't actually establish these neat little causality uh, principles that we have relied on by and large um, in, in, in our system so far. I would, I would just footnote this. We, of course, have also created alternative mechanisms, but typically in the capitalist space. I'm just thinking, for example, about um, you know, the, what we call here in this country, the fraud on the market theory that causation, reliance causation is substituted very often with just looking at the market price. Um, and these kind of substitutions could be a you know, could, we could substitute with something else, not in this specific space, but I'm just saying we have been able to be more creative about how we use these old fashioned legal mechanisms in favor of capitalist uh, principles. And I think we have to do the same kind of legal engineering in this space as well. So let me stop here and, and, and listen to your questions. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, uh, for this presentation. So let's open the q and I can see there is one question already uh, from Ayatullahi Seydou. Please excuse me for my pronunciation. If you'd like to ask the question by yourself, please unmute yourself. Are you there? Yes, you are. Would you like to ask the question by yourself? Um, excuse me, my name is Ayatullah. I'm reaching you from Istanbul, uh, Turkey. Uh, I would like to ask my question quickly. Thank you, Professor Fezofal, for your beautiful presentation. Um, I would like to know um, if you can elaborate a little bit on what you mean by capital being wealth generating assets. For instance, does your definition include financial derivatives? But these are speculative instruments. They do not necessarily sometimes have underlying assets, and that can be problematic in the market. Uh, again, what do you think about central bank independence? In other words, does central bank independence affect the code of capital? Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for these questions. So, so yes, I think um, I, I try to, to to explain this in, in the code of capital as well. What one of the most fascinating developments has been that many of the most valuable assets today are themselves creatures of the law. So land used to be the most important source of wealth until the end of the 19th century, even in the advanced industrializing countries. But that changed afterwards, ever since financial assets, intellectual property rights, immaterial goods that exist only by basically a collective decision that they are legally, legally protected interests are the, have become the most valuable assets. Right. So, so this is the big irony that we live in a world in this financial financialized world where everything that people make money off and money itself is, of course, also a social resource is created from the law. So your complex derivatives 
there are basically claims that we create in law because we package certain kind of other interests on top of each other. And you have, and at the end of the day, you have you create certain priority rights depending on how you do the structure directly. You have um, protected other assets that are not directly accessible. It's, a, it's the same mechanism essentially in a much more complex fashion, but the underlying asset might just be another claim against somebody else, right? So you have this daisy chains of, of claims against one another, but, but that's the point. You have created a system where people can use the law to produce wealth creating asset from the law and you don't need a real asset and people always think still of land or goods widgets, but in fact most the most important assets are these intellectual property rights. What do I think about central bank um, independence? You know, I think um, the money system is like the legal system, a, a social system, and uh, how we govern it is really important. We have decided to create independent courts, but there, of course, that's also a good question: whom they whom they serve. Same with central banks. I think central banks have are deeply politicized and political institutions, and I think they have hidden for too long behind the veil of independence. Um, we have seen since the 2008 crisis very explicitly um, who is being protected, who's not being protected, and at the very least thinking about how to guide a, a sort of a relatively independent regulator in making decisions for others has to be thought through uh, much more because um, the, 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 the policy space that central banks have um, put them into a position of power that I think in democracies is difficult to justify. Thank you very much. Um, so we can go to the next question. Actually, I have missed this one. Um, Felipe Mauro, uh, he has asked the question uh, first, but I mistake, made a mistake. So if you would like to ask the question by yourself, it would be the best. Sure, yeah. thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Um, I hope you can. Uh, my, my question, I'll, I'll, I'll read it out. Um, it's actually perhaps two questions. So uh, what could or should be the role of risk in legal reasoning in this process of transformation of the law away from a capitalist legal system? And more broadly, how could we integrate mechanisms of ex ante deliberation in private law instead of relying solely on ex post mechanisms? You use the words responsibility, liability, redress, uh, also the concept of uh, balancing interests um, usually happens in an ex post scenario. Um, so how could we perhaps integrate mechanisms of ex ante deliberation? Yeah, um, uh, that's a very good question. And I think, you know, that's really where we would, would have to go, go, go definitely. I, I'm trying to capture this a little bit by saying, um, you know, there should be no rights without responsibility. So as a, at the very conceptual basis, how we configure these interests, legal interests in principle, that, um, that it, it has to be imbued in the way that um, the, the legal system is um, willing to sanction them. So that's, that's always this exposed nature because of course private party can uh, can argue and uh, make arrangements amongst them as they wish but i think the principle that th this is everything is contingent and that we have to think about what the contingencies are um i think is critical we can't only solve this ex exposed level it's not on only enough to say exposed effects will have ex ante effects in the behavior of people, but it has to be normatively embedded in how we think about rights. If uh, we think about property rights and, and property rights also in, in, in immaterial goods. Um, risk is also an important issue, right? Um, and I think uh, uh, I think we have, we have tried to basically cabin risk in a certain way. And then think about when do you have legal responsibility for certain risks that you're, you know, takes across negligence, recklessness, and stuff like that. But we also have to uh, make very clear that we live in a world of uh, fundamental uncertainty. And while we do want to uh, make sure that some people nonetheless act, even when faced with uh, faced with fundamental uncertainty, if you do this primarily for the pursuit of your own interests without regards to the interests of others, even if you could not possibly have known what exactly the causal mechanisms are, I think we should attribute liability and we should make clear very, very, um, from, from, from the get-go that we're talking, this is what the precautionary principle, I think in my, my framing is supposed to do, is to say um, uh, we have to broaden responsibility and also the recognition that these rights are imbued with these responsibilities from the get-go. 
uh, and not not cabin basically fundamental uncertainty by saying, oh, we in the legal system we only deal deal with risks that you could actually have foreseen before we um, say you might be responsible ex ante uh, exposed or mm -hmm. uh, you know say you have a right ex ex, ex ante. You you can hear from my own response. I sort of the how to do this in an ex at the ex, ex ante at the beginning is really hard um, to think through because uh, you know you can easily imagine how people reinterpret this in their own contracts and their own device of way they, they structure these rights and so. So I, I have to think about how to give them clearer guidance, but I take the point that it can't only be exposed. Thank uh, you. I hope uh, Philippe is satisfied. <laughs> sure, perhaps I could uh, uh, offer um, my, my own thoughts on this uh, based on my interest in sort of technology law mm -hmm. and the recent uh, laws coming out of the European Commission uh, for the digital space. Uh, yep. For instance, in the GDPR, seems to be a move away from rights to a uh, risk-based reasoning, mm -hmm. and I think that this might be a place to look for. Um, and I'm thinking how to characterize the risk impact assessment as a private law mechanism. That's a good idea. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's very yeah. good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so the next question is from. Uh, Nikhil Kaza, uh, if you'd like to ask the question by yourself, Nikhil, are you here? Are you, yes. Can you ask the question by yourself? Well, Nikhil cannot un unmute himself, so you'll have to do the Yeah, part. so that's the best thing. If you are unable, then I will okay. just read it out. Okay, better to read it out. So, um, okay. Okay, no, it's just a comment. So, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. It's just a comment. <laughs> I didn't check it. So, uh, so if nobody has any question, I will use my privilege to ask the ask some question, but uh, I would like others to ask and have their chances. Maybe I can, I can still respond to Nikhil's um, com comment. Um, what is the difference between property rights and and contracts, um, you know, I think it's it's interesting. Uh, in, from as a civil lawyer, there's a it's a clear um, uh, boundary between this, and I think the civil law in, in general polices this boundary more rigorously. Um, so contracts can be it, it doesn't have to be only over property rights. You can have proper contracts for services, contracts for all kinds of things, right? Um, but the but the question is whether you can create through contract something that has the, the, the full backing of the, st the state typically gives for property rights. That's an absolute right that has you know relevance to others. So once you create a property right, others have to respect it, whether or not they were part of the contract. So the contract is binding on the two parties and might be pr protected from third party intervention. So if somebody who interferes with the contracts could be, it could be a tortious action against that person. But the notion that something that is recognized as a property right will have the full backing of the state um, in terms of against other parties that were not at the deal. I think that's sort of this uh, universality aspect um, that, that distinguishes it conceptually uh, property rights from, 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 from contracts. And I think um, what has happened over time is that the boundaries between have been blurred. In the common law system, you can, the most, the best example is always the trust. You alter property rights through what is essentially a contractual arrangement. Uh, and that's why also the trust has never been recognized in civil law jurisdictions because they have a different conceptual starting point between, for the two bodies of law. Karnad, please go ahead. Uh, yes, please. Good to see you. Uh, yeah, good to see you as well. Um, sorry, I, I'm supposed to be on another call right now, but I couldn't resist myself. So let me ask you, uh, first of all, thanks for, for the presentation. Uh, really fascinating stuff setting uh, the foundations of a new research paradigm uh, very interesting stuff but um i just wanted to ask you uh you know if all law is capitalist which it isn't but also kind of is right then what types of institutions are socialist right so perhaps informal institutions right such as reputations and relationships uh and you know <coughs> law and finance scholars have sort of hinted at that so i'm thinking about you know some of the work that um, Franklin Allen has done on China, right? The law of finance and economic growth in China. You know, basically trying to understand and, and figure out uh, the puzzle, you know, why is China growing if it ha doesn't have, you know, a strong legal system, right? And they, they, have, they have basically identified, uh, you know, informal institutions, again, such as relationships and uh, reputation as the key, key sort of explanatory variables. Uh, 
So I guess the question is, what is the role, if any, of informal institutions in your framework? Yeah, that's a very good, it's a, I think it's a very, very good question. I also like the idea of saying, okay, what, what then is, is socialist? If all law is capitalist, what is socialist? And I think it goes back to the withering away of the state and the law, and of course, then what replaces it. And I think Marx and also Pashto Khanis had this idea of a more communitarian, kind of romantic communitarian kind of setting. Um, you know, I've, I've always disagreed with Alan about his characterization of China because, you know, there's a part, there's a, there's a dual system. It's a party state, it's, it's a state. And if you just say this is a state institution, the formal legal system, as we know this in the West, and you don't understand how the party actually governs the country, then, and that's also kind of formal, right? I mean, it's not, doesn't really look like our legal system, but it's deeply structured and, and it's also rather predictable. I mean, every government official has a handbook about the rights of the communist party in nominating people people and sanctioning people throughout the system. So it is a formalist structure, it's just not, doesn't look like ours. And I think that's, a, that's just a conceptual mistake they made. Nonetheless, I think the, the conceptual move that you're making is an important one. So, so and that's, that's what I'm struggling with reading these, you know, the, the, the Marxist literature is because I'm just not a believer in communitarian, you know, just um, holding hands and, and dancing and, and everything will be fine. I mean, it's just, it's, it's not enough. We have to really imagine what this would mean, right? And I think we have to think about in complex societies, I don't think we can be without scalable um, uh, re, um, social, so we can't rely only on social relations. We have to have scalable institutions that transcend our direct knowing of each other, the monitoring each other, etc. So then, you know, and I would say everything that has kind of this scalable thing and has some course of means behind it is, is law, whatever you name you want to give it, give it otherwise. And so then the question is, can we think of law that is structured in ways that would certainly mitigate sort of this extreme, um, you know, legal entitlements enforcing these individual rights to which some people have better access than others. Um, uh, but I think part of that, of course, would be to think about what today is informal because it has not been recognized. And I think my move would be to say not to protect the informal, but to think about how to give them access to similar means of um, of, of enforcement, if, if necessary, or how to, how to give them the means to organize them in certain ways. And that has also many different aspects. You know, when you think about like business organizations, um, most co-op statutes are, have never been amended for, you know, 30, 40, 50 years. I mean, there's a little bit of a move in the United States nowadays to do this again, but we have had in the past organizational forms that were much more communitarian, but there were also organizational forms that say somehow how people who don't know each other have some kind of default rules, which makes it easier for them to organize each other. So I don't want to fetishize law as such, but I think it's naive to think that in you know, societies of you know, 300 million or a billion people, we can just rely on, on informal institutions. I'd rather say there are a lot of um, uh, examples where people learn how to organize themselves around certain things. And that could be made easier. I don't wanna go to, just down the path of DeSoto, you know, just saying you know, formalize everything, but do uh, create new kind of more creative um, mechanisms by which people could could do that. And it's not the party state in China that I would embrace. <laughs> uh, any more question? I have one question, uh, but I can ask if nobody has any question. Okay, maybe I ask and if there's other questions, they can come later. So uh, my worry is whenever the uh, laws has a tendency to proliferate, so if there is a law on one sector, it goes to the other sectors. So if there is duty imposed on corporations, it will proliferate. So um, I'm, I'm worried about uh, the rights-based uh, legislation and supranational laws, such as um, uh, international covenants on social cultural uh, rights and et cetera, et cetera. So then the duties will come and said, okay, you're poor, you have to perform. So the poor laws come to my mind. So I was wondering, have you thought about it? Yeah, no, I, I, I you know, I, I hear you. I think that that is a tendency. Um, uh, and, and I think whatever you do, it will probably be pushed by some into extreme position where it gets perverted as well, right? And, uh, and I think what I don't want to say is that, you know, we just now built into all the bilateral investment treaties obligations for countries to respect labor law in the ways that sort of the Western countries that have the bargaining power think it's right, right? I don't, I don't think that, that, that that's the point. I think that, you know, in that sense, um, you know, there, there is sort of a kind of a communitarian spirit in, in my ideas. I think the, the conditions under which 
people can harness not only their own imagination and, and their own negotiation power, but can harness also the collective resource that is the coercive means. They have to be set such that they are um, harder to gain for those who just want to pursue their own individual interests without respect for others. And they have to be more easy, made more easily accessible for those that have been denied that access in, in the past. So it's, it's a rebalancing act. And I don't think this can work necessarily just by saying, now we have a new charter on these kind of rights and a new charter on that kind of rights, but we have to think, um, because very often it's also empty, right? There's nothing really behind that unless you, 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 you arm them with certain kind of principles or you really imbue the way in which we organize the fundamental principles of both our international and domestic law in a way that um, people have a real say for, over that. We could, you know, there's of course, you know, at some point you have to cabin each project, but I, I realize of course that there is, um, there is a fundamental critique of our current um, democratic system built into this as well. Um, I'm always reminded of um, this book by um, Jonathan Levy, who wrote a book about ages of, this, ages of American capitalism last year. And he says at some point, very true, but you have to think about it, is that America was first capitalist and then democratic. And I've been thinking about, you know, this is true for almost every country. And I would say maybe, maybe India after independence, um, and then throughout until the 1990s, it was first more socialist and then became capitalist again, but it was built on the basis of a colonial capitalist economy. So it's very hard to find an exception to that. So most of our democracies have embraced the basic principles of capitalist law from the get go with the individual rights, etc. And have um, uh, um, given privileges to, to capital in many ways, many sort of more disguised way. And so I think we ultimately this is, of course, calls for a different type of um, political arrangement as well. So it's not just the replication of the same kind of legal institutions that we had before, the same kinds of legislative modes or international conventions, but thinking, I think one really has to think from scratch, mostly starting from this notion, what we're talking about is who has access to the means of coercion on what grounds and who decides who has access to this means of coercion on what grounds. And that has to be built into a political system where the people who are directly affected by that will have to have the power over deciding these kinds of things. Thank you very much. Actually, you touched upon my second question, but yeah, I was I was worried about uh, how the power will come into this whole uh, theory because ultimately laws are made by people with power. I mean, either yeah. finance or power. So, thank you for touching upon that. So, uh, Farhad, uh, you had raised your hand, but I don't know if you want to still ask the question. Yes, uh, of course I have. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. Excellent. And uh, my question is, uh, my worry is about the philosophy of law. As you implied in your presentation, law uh, is a kind of like incomplete contract by nature. And it always can be, can be circumvented and uh, taken advantage of. And we know law is a kind of public goods and it's got in every law has got egalitarian, libertarian and communitarian tendencies. And different countries and different cultures balance these three forces differently. And we know modernity by nature because it's a reaction to Christianity and the, the rest of the story is individualistic by nature and the, the private interest and is at the core of it. And your attempt to rebalance the communitarian interest and egalitarian interest versus the individualistic and libertarian interest may be, I, I sense, is doomed because of this, uh, the spirit behind the law, which is at the heart of modernity, which is individualistic. And the communitarian egalitarian is a, like, like, a, um, like an evil, but is an, a sort of uh, inevitable evil. You have to have it because to protect the individual interest. That's why as long as you don't rebalance this collective interest, you may fall into the trap of tragedy of commons and like prisoner's dilemma. And you try to rebalance it. And like uh, in, in one example is the access to law, as you interest, you said the access to Farad, is- Farad, I'm sorry, uh, can you make it short? Can, can you, can you yeah, ask yeah. your question? I was I'm just very trying sorry, to give but... an example, yeah. like access to law is one example of this, how the, uh, the elites can have access to law and this public good, which is law. 
what I'm saying is as long as you don't have the trust and the, the collective uh, interest as a change in the spirit of law and public and uh, general people, uh, ordinary people don't change their mindset and the philosophy behind the law, those, uh, those attempts to rebalance these three types of uh, approaches may be doomed and gloomed. Sorry about the... No, no, I, no, I, I, I hear you. I, I hear you. So let me just tell you this. When I, when I presented the outline of my book to my faculty in September, I basically said, I don't see a way, way out. If I'm right about these three laws, we are doomed because we just can't get out. You know, legal arbitrage will always will be with us. The system as it works, you know, it's sort of in, with legal arbitrage, we're going to reinforce the same system, features of the system that we already have. And I just don't see a way out. I said, please help me to find a way out. And then I got a very strong pushback and everybody said, you have to find one because you can't write a book that is just doomed. So I, I, I'm, I'm not totally naive, but I think the most substantive, I think, response to your questions is to say, you know, what comes first and maybe the two things come together. I think we need both. We need a change in institutions. We need a change in thinking. And I think we need change in our political institutions as well. Um, so so the where, where do you start? Is you start, you know, as a professor, you're writing about something that you think you know a little bit more about than, than about the rest. And you're trying to make some inroads and connect, connect to others who, who are asking the some of the bigger questions. So I, I do believe, and this is why I wanted to bring climate change in, because there's no better example to say that unless we do this collectively, we're doomed, we're sitting all in the same boat. Now, I'm, I'm totally realistic and cynical about the fact that I, I, I know how it's gonna work, right? Unless we might defer the end game a little bit, but the end game will be the guys with the biggest pockets, the biggest guns will survive the longest. And we will build more walls and, and shoot people at the, you know, at entrance if necessary. That, that, that's just a horror story that you just have in front of your eyes. It's already happening. It's not something that you have to make up. So that so the I think um, the what we ha have to do, I think at, at the very least, is to make sure that we can live together collectively as long as possible and make this planet livable for most of us for as long as possible. Uh, I, I'm not sure we can save humanity. I don't have these ambition. And that's that's basically the impetus with which I'm writing this book. And what are the principles that we would have to live by to make sure that we can live in a bounded planet? It's not even, I'm not talking communism, right? I'm just talking, it, but because this is a collective undertaking. And if we can't do this, then then yes, we're doomed. So, I, But I'm, I just want to say it's not impossible. We've seen elements of that. We have overridden very often, you know, legal arbitrage. I just, you know, I'm teaching corporations for an LLM group right now and again, reading case law in Delaware and the courts say, you know, what, whatever is, even what is legally possible under statutory law might be inequitable. That's sort of a nice way of saying it. And then, you know, but then in such principles could be harnessed in other um, contexts as well. You might be able to do this, the kind of legal arbitrage, but we, you, you can't get the enforcement powers because we don't do this for stuff that is fundamentally inequitable and broaden that concept applied in different settings. So um, what I'm saying is we've had this and it, it has been diluted as well over time, but we can go back to principles and um, maybe invent new ones and new mechanisms that allow us to bring more of them, you know, what is what is just, what is right, what is what, what, what do you really have input from people who are directly affected by what's going on? I don't, I don't really see another way because otherwise I'm just going to go back to where I was after the summer after I did all my reading in the beginning and I outlined the book and said, sorry, I think, you know, we can just give up. Then I shouldn't write the book and maybe just retire. <laughs> so, yeah, but I'm, I'm not totally naive. I, I'm with you. I'm, I, I just, I'm just trying as, far, as hard as I can. Thank you. Thank you very much. So there's one question again from uh, Ayatollah. Uh, if you'd like to ask the question by yourself, you're most welcome. Yes, Professor, one last question, if you don't mind. Um, as you were explaining or responding to the other answers, then this came to my mind. And I thought I should ask you whether um, you would recommend uh, multiplexity in modern legal philosophy as a way of uh, cost correcting the code of capital. So for instance, we have found that, of course, in recent times, uh, most of what uh, most of the laws that get um, executed, um, especially in most parts of, uh, let's say, emerging markets and even frontier markets, uh, happen to have epistemological roots from, let's say, the West. Um, and then um, uh, that that's, doesn't accommodate properly 
the social dynamics. So you tend to have uh, laws that have been made, let's say the English common law as applied in my home country, Ghana, or the French common law as applied in, say, let's say, Senegal, having epistemological roots from the white do not necessarily accommodate, in terms of public purpose, for instance, accommodate the entire social dynamics. So um, what do you think about that? And this even leads to what uh, Professor Stiglitz has recently found out about the efficient market hypothesis, for instance, um, as being in decline or not, not really efficient, if uh, for lack of a better way, if I can say that. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about that, Professor? Yeah, so so you know, I, I I think you're you're right, of course, and I think you know we should also remind ourselves the expansion of law. I mean, during colonialism, the colonizers brought their law with them, and for a reason, <laughs> right? It's not that they just said we want to have the territory and we want to control the people. They did this through law and with law, and they instilled legal systems that benefited the system, and very often in a much more radical way in the colonized countries than they were was, were able to. At home. At, able, at, at home, like in England, for example, they were still constrained by other conservative forces and couldn't do the whole thing that they did in, in North America. For example, I give an example in the, in the book where they changed the relationship between creditors and owners in, in, in North America in 1732. They made the same change in England only in the, in the end of the 19th century after their own system had collapsed. So they basically empowering creditors against owners, right? So, so, so you can see that in the colon, in the colonies, actually, I said this. I think they even sort of this 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 radical capitalist mode of very often extractive mode it was realized in the legal system even stronger than it had been in the West and still there, and it sort of tried to um, uh, un undermine and erode and destroy many of the um, social conventions, practices, legal systems that pre-existed. And I've written about the transplant effect uh, two decades ago, where I basically show that countries that have experienced this colonized transplantation of law have much less effective legal institutions today. They've always struggled with that. And again, it's, you know, somebody else has figured out who has access to your collective means of coercion and what conditions, and everybody else has to abide by that, even though you have different types of norms. Um, also, Narendra Pani, um, uh, the sociologist from, from Bangalore has written um, very, 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 very good examples about the history of, of, of corruption and, and the lack of authority of the law because of the colonial experience. experience. So, so I think this is, you know, in, in on top of what I was saying, but I think we could also harness very often the local practices that pre-existed the capitalist mode, where people found arrangements to get along with each other, even at scale to find different ways of organizing. And one of the, and basically loosening the stronghold of the Western instilled law in these countries and seeing whether you can build something new. You can't just, you know, just go back to where you were before, of course, but there's still practices and ideas and, and notions that could, could actually be much more productive as people are also pointing in land management to what indigenous people are still doing in this country and many other parts of the world as well, healing the land, not only exploiting it. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, so there are practices out there which could also be scaled, right? That have could be recognized as 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 maybe even superior and should be imbued with the with the right protection, at least against the exploitation by the capitalist mode, if not as a way to to expand and 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 scale it to other parts of the world in the reverse order. So we are almost. Uh, finishing this session. So we still have one more question if anybody has any question. Anisha, uh, if you have any question, otherwise I will give the floor to you to formally conclude the session. I think I will, am I audible? Yeah, so I don't have much of a question here, but uh, just to get your comment, Professor, like rather than having a blanket change in the law structure, which sector would you say that we should focus on, start with, try out, have a pilot in that sector, and then move on to something else, see whether it works there or not. If you could have a one priority sector where we'd like to bring a change. Um, you know, I'm, yeah, that's a, it's a very good question. I think, I'm not sure I would go by sector. I think I would go by aspects of the law and I, I probably would go to civil procedure law. I would go basically exactly where we have access to the means of coercion, thinking who should, for what con under what conditions, be able to claim that and wow. have an easy access to enforce this, his or her own claims, and, and that, that's where I think would start. 
because that could actually destabilize everything. <laughs> and I, I'm just thinking about where we could basically destabilize the system that's so deeply entrenched and say, actually, if we give others, and, and that it doesn't mean just, again, litigation of private you know, rights to sue, or but, but certainly as well, collective rights or empowering certain types of organizations, but also means um, what, kind of, what kind of state agencies can we think of that could um, basically represent certain collective interest in, in certain areas. Obviously, it's, you know, it's, it's everything that has to do with climate change, but everything has to do with climate change right now, right? And um, so, so, so thinking about, you know, you could say if, if it's, it's access to coercion plus maybe dealing with, you know, brown assets, uh, you know, uh, attributing harm to them, um, thinking about how to mutualize the losses um, for those who have been harmed, but you can't really allocate the causation really. We still have to think about how to mutualize these. That, that, that would be, you know, so most pressing issues. And that's where I would start, I think. I think three of our professors who've spoken on dissecting capitalism have, have sort of like identified that. Uh, it was Professor Jayati Ghosh, Professor Sasek Sassin, and yourself. Yes, yeah, well, that's where so, we are. Right. Yeah. So thank you, everybody. Professor, it was wonderful to have you with us. We hope that in future also you will continue to engage with us. To all our participants, thank you so much for your intriguing questions and uh, being with us here. And Satvik, could you just uh, tell them about the next upcoming webinar and then we will formally close the session. Thank you, everybody. Okay, I have to check it. Maybe I will do it off the record. So with this, we officially uh, end the session. Uh, you can hang with us for five more minutes if you want to ask any question that you didn't want to ask on record. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thanks.